Hello, this is Dr. Jim Thomas, and I want to welcome you to Fayetteville First Baptist Online. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're encouraged in your faith and challenged to walk toward a Christ-centered life. If you have any questions about today's message or would like to have more information on what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, please don't hesitate to email me at info at fayettevillefbc.org. I hope you're encouraged today. May God bless you. Church family, glad to be here with you today. We're going to stand. We come here for one reason, and that's to worship our Lord Jesus. So sing this song with me.
and have not loved. I am only a resounding gong or a playing cymbal. And if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient and love is kind. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. How's everyone? Amen. Amen. I want to thank Dylan Miller for leading us and leading our worship team today in worship and uh, in Pastor Ronnie's absence. So Dylan, thank you. Uh, wherever you went, there you are right there. Hey man. Dylan is a senior at University of Mobile. Amen. Penny says amen. And uh, he's a senior at University of Mobile and has led worship uh, throughout the Southeast uh, with some of their worship teams. Actually, he's led with their team here on a Sunday night. So thank you, man, for, for filling in today. We really appreciate that a lot. I, I am a, I'm a History Channel junkie. Uh, do we have any History Channel junkies in the room? Thank you. Yes, uh, some proud people with that. Now, one thing we have to do whenever we watch TV is that we also we have to have discernment, right? And so we understand that we want, when we watch channels like the History Channel, there is true history on the History Channel. And then there's pseudo-history on the History Channel. And then there's historical entertainment 
on the History Channel. And so uh, when you go to that and you're watching documentaries, do put that through the filter of what actually happened sometimes. But uh, there are some historical uh, entertainment values uh, that the History Channel brings. One of those shows I actually haven't watched until the season finale. I, I never got into the show, never took time to it, but this show is called Alone. Has anybody ever seen the show Alone? Several of you, yeah, we got a thumbs up in the back. That's great. Here's the premise of the show. The premise of the show is this, that they take 10 people, they're allowed to bring 10 survival things of whatever they are, and they are dropped somewhere in the world without a producer, without any, any type of camera crew on hand, and the one that survives the longest wins. Anybody up for it? Uh, one, okay, one person in the corner over there. Great, we'll talk later. Uh, this season, they were sent to Patagonia, which is in Argentina, and they were simply dropped off miles apart from somebody else. They were given cameras. Now, here's, here are the rules of the show. You can only have 10 survival mechanisms of whatever you choose to bring. There are no producers or anybody else on site with you, and you have to take the cameras and film yourself. If you stop filming yourself, then they come in with a boat and you're kicked off the show, okay? Now, the winner of the show gets $500,000. Anybody in now? Okay, we got a couple more people in. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so I haven't watched this show at all, but I saw the season finale, so I just asked, I'll stop there as History Channel. I'll watch what's going on. Well, there were three contestants left at the end of this season, and one of the, a couple reasons they pull you out of the show would be, and they have a satellite phone, so if there's an emergency, they can call, and of course, they're videoing everything so people can see, the producers can see what's going on. But the reasons you're pulled from the show is, number one, you quit. Okay, like I'm done, I'm missing fried chicken, whatever that happens to look like for you, and you call them and say, get me out of here. The next reason are for medical reasons. Now, if your BMI, your body mass index, falls below 17, then they pull you off the show because under 17, you have the possibility of organ failure and ultimate death, okay? So you want to be pulled off at that point. So those are the two ways you're, you're off of the show. So they had three people left in the season finale. And one of them in that episode quits. She just goes, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm missing home. Come get me. So she's gone. Now, none of, them, none of the rest of the players know what's going on with this, right? And so the next player, they, they, they come for random medical checks to make sure that they're okay. So they, they drive the boat up, and this, this, there's a guy and a girl left, and this girl's sitting there, and they check her out, and she had a 16.8 BMI. And they said, you're done, you're out. And of course, she was heartbroken because she had gone a long time. Well, the guy who was left doesn't know he's the only one left, but he hears a boat coming uh, and he goes, oh, they're either going to kick me off because of medical conditions and or um, they're just coming for a random medical check. And so they pull up, they come up to him and he's, he's pretty emaciated at this point. In fact, the winner of the show uh, had lost 33% of his body weight. And so they come up to him, and then the medical man steps out of the way, and his wife is standing there. And she looks at him and says, you won. And, of course, he just breaks down. He's just done with everything at that point. They interview him after the show, and he had been there 87 days. Check that out, okay? And they interview him after the show, and he's so elated, number one, to be going home. Uh, number two, to actually eat food because he hadn't eaten in a while. No, you know, maybe, maybe you have to supplant that with number two, seeing his wife um, and his kids. He's from Maine. He's a Mainer. And, um, and they start interviewing him after the fact. And he said, you know, I, I, would, I would not have given up this opportunity for anything. I enjoyed doing it. It was a challenge beyond any challenge I've ever had in my life. But here's my conclusion. We were not meant to live alone. We were not meant to do this life by ourselves. We were meant for human contact and human relationship. And he said more than anything else, more than the food, more than the creature comforts of life, I missed being with people. You see, we were created for relationships with one another. All of us need, at least to some degree, the consistent interaction with other people to maintain our emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual Health. It's interesting to watch clips from the show where you see him at the beginning like, I can conquer the world, and in the end they're weeping in a corner like a baby because of the lack of inter interaction with other people. You see, without it, we begin to waste away and live an unhealthy lifestyle. And unfortunately, folks, I think that's what begins to happen in our homes if we're not careful. 
You see, when we cease to interact and communicate effectively within our families, we hinder our personal growth and our witness as a family to a lost world. And as a result, things start to crumble around us. You see, without healthy communication, there is no healthy family. If we're not truly speaking and listening to one another in a healthy way, then the family starts to disintegrate around us as we start to separate ourselves into our own selfish world. Even if other people are sitting in the same room with us, yet we're holding back those things that need to be communicated, whether they be good or bad things, if you will, we start to self-destruct as a family because we're not effectively talking and communicating with one another. Pastor Tim Keller in his book, The Reason of God, talks about this general reality for us. He said, ultimate reality is a community of persons who know and love one another. That is what the universe, God, history, and life is all about. If you favor money, power, and accomplishment over human relationships, you will dash yourselves on the rocks of reality. It is impossible to stay fully human if you refuse the cost of forgiveness between people, the substitutional exchange of love, and the confinements of community. Community's tough. Family's tough. It's high citizenship, if you will. You've got to engage and you've got to be intentional in that. But if we don't do that, we don't grow and we don't have health in our relationships. Keller continues, he says, We believe the world was made by a God who is a community of persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, who have loved each other for all eternity. You were made for mutually self-giving, other-directed love. Self-centeredness destroys the fabric of what God has made. It's a powerful statement. The Apostle Paul speaks to the general concept of us being in relationship with one another and talks about how we are to behave within the, in the context of that relationship. In Philippians chapter 2, he says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, in other words, if you're a Christ follower today, if you've experienced grace today, then Paul says this, um, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves. Have this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And another translation would say that's how Christ modeled what relationships should look like. In other words, we were built for one another. Not only in the life of the church, but in the life specifically of the family. Therefore, it begs a question, how do we improve that family life? How do we improve the way we relate to one another in the life of our families? Well, and that speaks to the key truth we've been pursuing these three weeks now. If you want to write it down in your notes, you're welcome to do that. Some of you uh, may have gotten uh, worship guides today that are blank inside. We found a couple in the first service. Let me just say, we knew that, and that's specific. You need to take more notes today. Okay? That, that was meant for you. We love you that much this morning to provide you all that space. So in that space, write this. Key truth is this. Improving our homes begins with the pursuit of God's design, purpose, and mission for the family. Improving our homes begins with the pursuit of God's design, purpose, and mission for the family. Well, two weeks ago, we began this series called Home Improvement and over this month, we've been looking at those three things, God's design, purpose, and mission for the family. We began by looking at God's design for the family from the beginning in the covenant of biblical marriage. Last Sunday, we examined God's purpose in creating a discipleship culture within the life of the home as we disciple those within our home to be followers of Jesus. And today, we will look at one of the keys in relating to one another as we create a discipleship or a disciple-making culture within the life of the home by living in a healthy way through effective communication in the home. In other words, how do you speak to one another in your home? Isn't this going to be fun? It will today. We're going to look at one verse of Scripture today, and then we're going to tear that apart, look at each element of it, and I think we'll find some instruction toward that end. So if you have your Bibles in any format today, go ahead and go to Colossians chapter 4. We're going to look at specifically at verse 6. We'll look at the surrounding verses and some other verses in a minute. But we're specifically going to dig into this one verse today as we look at the idea of what it means to improve our talk, our speech 
within the life of the home. Colossians 4, verse 6, if you wouldn't mind standing in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Colossians 4, verse 6, this is the Word of the Lord. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated this morning. We usually take a lot longer section of Scripture, but I think there's enough right there for us to camp in for a long time. Now, let me give you a little bit of context on this verse itself, if I could. After exhorting the church back in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, through the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1, um, Paul is giving them appropriate behavior in Christian homes. He now challenges them to persistent prayer. In chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. And then he says to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time in chapter 4, verse 5. Well, he then speaks to the issue of how Christ's followers are to talk with those outsiders. Those who are far from God. Those who are not Christ's followers. Well, though this is meant as missional instruction, if you will, his words provide a great template in which to appropriately speak with all people. And if with outsiders, how much more so with those in the church and in the Christian home? In other words, Paul's giving us a general statement here. It's it's specifically targeted to speaking to those who don't know Jesus. But if that's the way we're supposed to speak to people who don't know Jesus, how much more so should we use this template to speak to those in the body of Christ and getting more intimate in the life of our homes, our families, our marriages? Okay, Colossians 4. Verse 6. So what can we find, what truths can we find out of this verse that may help give us some direction in how we are supposed to improve our talk? The first one is this. We are to demonstrate grace in our speech. We are to demonstrate grace in our speech. Paul begins by establishing the standard for how Christ followers communicate with each other. He says, let your speech always be gracious. Always be gracious. The Greek word for always here indicates habitual action, something you do over and over and over again, something that happens continually and not only when it's beneficial to the individual speaker. Some of you are old enough in the room, um, well, some of you are old enough in the room. Some of you are old enough in the room to remember reruns of Leave it to Beaver. Anybody remember reruns? Praise Jesus. Um, Some of you saw original airings. Do you want to testify today? Okay. Okay, a few. Oh, there you go. Praise God. Look at that. Okay. Now, this show, you kids, that was, they, they, feel, they used to make TV in black and white. Crazy. I know. I know. It's wild stuff. But this show was, it was a comedy. It was a family comedy. And there was a kid um, named Eddie Haskell on the show. And Eddie was the boys in the show, well, one of the boys, Wally's best friend. And Eddie would come in, and whenever he would talk to the parents, man, it was Mr. Clean, wasn't it? He was up there, and he was always saying the right thing. He was over-flattering to the parents. He was, oh, yes, the world is great, and I'm the greatest guy in the world because I just want to be... And then he got with the boys, and the mask came off. And he was kind of a scoundrel, wasn't he? He was the typical definition of a hypocrite. A hypocrite, remember, in the Greek means a play actor. It means someone who puts on a face publicly, but it's not really who he is. You know, I wonder sometimes in our speech if we're not the same way. We come to church, or we go to work, or we go in the community, and we put the mask on through our speech of this is who I am, and this is what I believe, and all this stuff, and we get home, and we take the mask, and we put it away, and it starts to reveal our true character. Or maybe we put the mask on and we're talking a certain way and we're trying to make ourselves maybe bigger than we are and then the pressure of life comes and it puts us in that vice and all of a sudden our desires, selfish desires by the way, are being kind of squeezed out of whatever situation we're in and all of a sudden that mask starts slipping and we say something we don't want to say, we don't mean to say, but it's really coming out of our heart, right? You know, when Paul says here... Let your speech always be gracious. He's talking about this habitual action. In other words, this is how a Christ follower is to speak all the time and not just on occasion. The result of our words ought to be the overflow of our hearts. 
And he says then that they are to make their speech gracious. Now here, Paul is indicating that not only the content, but also the manner of speaking are important when it comes to the influence of believers on others. Christ followers are to have a charming and attractive tone in their speech and not one of hostility and divisiveness. We're actually supposed to be attracting to people. Why? Because we're attracting them to the Savior that we say we serve, right? You ever met a mean Christian? I'm just asking. I'm in ministry. I meet them all the time. And, and they're like this. I love Jesus. I just hate everybody else. You know what I'm saying? And they come at you, and they're usually growling when they come into your presence, right? And it can be words, or it can just be a noise, or it can be a demeanor, but you kind of see them coming. Because it's where they're living right now, and they're just kind of ready to throw up their life all over you, right? And what I found as a pastor is usually my fault somehow. I don't, I don't know how that ends up being the case. I just usually send them to Aaron's office. <laughs> He's a lot more gentle than I am. <laughs> have you ever met a mean Christian before? Have you ever been a mean Christian before? I have. I have. There have been seasons in my life where I felt like life was not fair. Right? I don't find a lot of statements regarding fairness in Scripture. I find a lot of statements about surrender and obedience, but I don't find a lot of statements about fairness. But you know what? Every once in a while I get real selfish and my way isn't the way that's happening around me and I kind of get selfish and I kind of, well, I kind of deserve this. And I'll get snippy with the people around me and I'll, whether it be in home or at church or in the community or wherever, and I'll respond in a way and afterwards the Holy Spirit who dwells in me because I belong to Jesus convicts me. And you know, it's very humbling to go back to someone who's a believer and say, man, hey, please forgive me for that. I, I was in a bad place at the time. I made a bad choice to respond to you in that way. I'm, please forgive me for that. It's more humbling to go to your wife or your child and do the same thing. And I'd say it's even more humbling to go before a non-believer and to ask their forgiveness. First of all, because they don't know what to do with that. Because that's not the normality of their life, Right? of people giving and receiving forgiveness. That's the body of Christ thing going on. But when I step outside the body, I feel like I've offended a non-believer because I've also ruined a witness to that person. And I go back and I ask their forgiveness for that and watch them kind of wrestle with this idea of, of humility before them and, and, and asking for their unconditional forgiveness. They've got to kind of figure out what all that is. And that opens a door to illustrate, if you will, what Christ has done for us and to demonstrate grace even as we desperately need their forgiveness. See, Christ followers are to have a charming and attractive tone, not one that's hostile or divisive. We're to extend grace. You know what grace is? It's unmerited favor or love. Another translation of the word for grace, cheros, would be kindness. Does that typify your speech in your home? Does that typify your speech in relationship to others? We're to extend that grace into the lives of others because it is the heart of the gospel. Therefore, especially in the home where we know and are known the best, we must guard against ungracious speech to those that we love the most. One author said it this way, Encourage others each and every day. Nothing's more important than our words. Did you know that on average, each of us speaks about 25,000 words daily? Did you know that? Now, that, some of that's based on personality. Some of you speak 25 million words daily. God bless you. I run out of words at the end of the day. I just do. I'm done. You know, and there's, there's a point of cutoff. Y'all know when you run out of words for the day and you're just like, give me my cave. You know, I, I can't do any more of this exchange anymore. And some of you are like, but I, I got about a billion words left. I got to get them out before we go to bed. You know, so you just sit there. You know, that thing. But on average, each of us speaks about 25,000 words daily. A lot of language, this author says, is flowing out of our mouths every day and having an impact on those around us. And then he asks a critical question. But how much of that flow is fulfilling God's intended purpose for our speech? How much of it reflects pride rather than a gospel-motivated humility? That's a powerful question right there. The writer of Hebrews speaks to this, and he says this, Hebrews 3.13. But exhort, and that word means to encourage, one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
You see, our words that are always to be gracious are meant to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, and to not tear down. So how do we do that? Well, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. You know what the word corrupting means? It means rotten or useless talk. It's kind of like this. Um, if, uh, sweet Georgia peach, come on now. Okay, You like sweet Georgia peaches, and you get one of those peaches when they're just in season, and you get them, and you bite into them, and the juice thing's kind of going. Now, imagine if you bit into that, and then you got in someone's face and started talking to them. Okay? First of all, get out of my space. But secondly, if you're going to do that, and you ate a peach, that's going to be kind of a good fragrant smell, right? Now, what if you went over here and grabbed an onion and did the same thing? Good. Now, who, some of you could probably do that with the onion. I, I just can't do onions anymore. But you bite in it. Well, we got sweet Vidalia onion. Oh, okay, what? It's an onion. Okay? And so you bite into the onion and you get into someone's face. You want peach or do you want onion? Yeah, come on now. Stretching the illustration, right? So let me ask you this question, Lucy. How's your speech? Is it like a peach or like an onion or garlic? Does it build up? Does it encourage? Or is it rotten? Useless. Listen to what Paul says again. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion. So you have to have wisdom. We're going to talk about that in a minute. That it may give grace, unmerited favor, to those who hear. When you walk away from a conversation in your home, are people built up or are they torn down? Are they encouraged or are they torn apart by your words? We are to demonstrate, if you're a Christ follower today, grace in our speech. But I think there's a second truth here that builds on that, and that is what we said a second ago. We're not only to demonstrate grace in our speech, we're to demonstrate wisdom in our speech. Wisdom in our speech. Secondly, the Colossians' gracious speech should be, as Paul says, seasoned with salt. In other words, believers' words should not be dull or uninteresting, but attractive and wise. Okay? Now, I heard a pastor one time say, a boring sermon is a sin. Now, I don't know how many times I've sinned against y'all in the last five years. <laughs> Hopefully not too many times. But, but isn't that truth? When we communicate, when we talk, why would we not want to be winsome? Why wouldn't we want to be attractive? Why wouldn't we want to be wise in what we say? Half of our problems today is because we speak before we think. Because we let something come out of our mouth because it's emotionally stored up in our heart. But in the end, we had not thought through what we said or the implications of what we said. And most of the time, I say some of the time, we really don't care about the implications. Because when we speak, we're just feeding the selfish desire that's within us. And yet, we, according to the Apostle Paul, are to season our words with salt. Paul uses the metaphor of salt to demonstrate the nature of our speech. Salt, which is a common household condiment in the first century. As today, I used it yesterday. Anybody use salt this week? Just saying. Nobody uses salt. Okay. Um, well, some of us use it for several purposes. First of all, it provides flavor for food that is tasteless and needs seasoning. Is that your language? And especially in the centuries before refrigeration was used to delay meat from decaying. Well, Jesus applies this idea to the life of his disciples, how we're supposed to live generally. In Matthew 5, 13 and 14, he calls his followers the salt of the earth. It's not just our speech, but it's supposed to be everything that we are. As salt keeps food flavored and preserved, so the Christian makes the, salt, makes the earth a purer and more palatable place. If you're a Christ follower today, because you're in a situation, is, is it a purer place than if you weren't there? That's what it means to be the salt of the earth. So those who are the salt of the earth are expected to have some savor in their language. Their words should preserve and not decay, encourage and not defame. Now, salt is also used in rabbinical literature, the literature uh, of the Old Testament that was written by rabbis, rabbinical literature, as a metaphor for wisdom. 
Christ followers are to respond with the right words, but also at the right time. Have you ever said something and they were, it was truth in someone's life, but it wasn't at the right time that they needed to hear it? You've done that before? You've had someone to do that in your life before? We, we lost, and many of you know, we lost a child before MK was born um, in childbirth, and, and we had so many people who tried to love on us, <laughs> some people who actually loved on us, and some people who really tried to love on us and really didn't know what to say, and we just took that at face value. But there was some wisdom that was given us that was just go away, you know, at the time. We really just want you to love on us and pray for us at this time, you know. Now, what they were saying wasn't necessarily false. It just wasn't the right time. And I think part of wisdom and understanding discernment is knowing that truth and timing go together. As we're sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as He directs us in the lives of relationships, right? And so as a result, we should have wisdom. We're to demonstrate wisdom in knowing when to speak and how to speak to each individual person. In other words, our speech is to be both winsome and wise in nature. This is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, verse 50. He said this, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Now, what does that mean for salt to lose its saltiness? Is it physically possible for salt to lose its saltiness? No, it's not Able, salt is not able to lose its saltiness unless it's been corrupted. Unless something else has been added to it that detracts from its saltiness. Unless it's been corrupted, it's become useless and honestly can even become dangerous. Listen again. Jesus says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness because of corruption, how will you make it salty again? The answer is you can't. So here's Jesus' command have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Is your speech corrupted? Has it become saltless? Jesus commands us, have salt in you. And when you do, you'll have peace with others. So it brings up a, a kind of a critical question for us this morning. So what happens in the life of the home, in the life of your business, and we can extend it to all life in general, but let's stay with the home, when there's conflict in the home? Here's one thing that I've learned in the years I've been alive, because I can't learn anything if I wasn't alive. Just making sure Peyton's awake on the front row. Here's what I've learned. If there are other people around, eventually there will be conflict. There just will. Why? Because we have different opinions on things. We have different plans for things. We have different people wanting to be in charge over things. You have different hearts. You have different backgrounds. You have different baggage. You have all this stuff coming together that we call human relationships. And if that's going to be the case, at some point, boom, that's going to happen, right? And if conflict happens, then we need to be equipped as Christ followers, if you are one today, in how to approach and process conflict. Because if we don't know how to do that, what we say really doesn't matter because we're probably already on the wrong track. So what does Jesus say about processing conflict? In Matthew 18, we find this, verses 15 through 17. Now, this is the key prerequisite here to what Jesus is about to say. He says, if your brother sins against you. Now, that, that's key. Okay, Because conflict, in Jesus' mind, is the result of sin, not the result of differing opinions. Now, we can have different opinions on things. Who's going to win the National League this year? Nobody? Oh, thank you. The Braves. Thank you. One, one fan in the room. Thank you very much. All right? We can have differing opinions on sports, on politics, on this, on that, on the other thing. And you know what? Both of us may not be wrong in that situation. But you know what? If sin enters into the equation, then there's going to be conflict especially if the gospel is present anywhere around because the gospel confronts sin. So what if there's a sin between you and somebody else? How do we process that? What does Jesus say? If your brother sins against you, go, listen, go and tell him his fault between him, you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, here's what I don't hear Jesus saying. If, you, if your brother has sinned against you, go tell everybody else except for him. I don't hear Jesus saying that. I don't hear Jesus saying, go talk behind his back. I don't hear him saying, get in a focus group together to see how we can attack this person. I don't hear, see, I, here, here's what I hear Jesus saying. 
If you have a problem with that person, go to that person. Boy, that alleviates a lot of junk right there. Now, what's the goal in going to that person? To win the conversation and the debate, right? Not according to Jesus. The goal is to win your brother. Is to have a right relationship. You see, if the goal is to win the debate, it's not about them, it's about you. It's about you and your selfish desires saying, look, I won. Guess what happens when you win the debate? Nobody wins. But when you surrender yourself and humble yourself and confront in love, which we'll talk about in a second, confront in love, you have a chance to do something incredible. And that is to win your brother or sister back in relationship. So, what happens if they don't listen? You went one-on-one, -on -one, they don't listen. But if he does not listen, Jesus says, take one, one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Well, what if he doesn't listen again? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, like someone who doesn't know God. Jesus gives us an out at the end that if we have gone two, three, four levels deep in trying to reconcile with a brother, not win an argument, and they're not willing to reconcile, let them go. Why? 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 Doesn't Jesus love everybody? Absolutely. He loves them enough to have to struggle with their sins so that one day they will repent and come back to him. So let's not be an enabler of somebody's sin by allowing them to continue to do it over and over again. Let's love them enough to confront and try to reconcile and try to heal. And if not, let's turn them over to the Lord who's been involved in the process the entire time and let Him deal with them from that point on. So how do we talk then if we have to go to confront someone? Because I, I would guess at least 75% of this room doesn't like confrontation. It's not what you wake up in the morning. Good, I get to confront someone today. You know? So how do you talk to someone? Well, Solomon gives us wisdom because that's what Solomon does. In Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2, this is what he says about our speech and confrontation. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Did you hear that? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pours out folly. We are to speak with a gentle tone toward those we are in conflict with. I had personal experience with this when I was in college. There was, I, I woke up, or I was back in my room doing something. I was studying. Um, and I heard yelling in the living room. We had four guys living in one apartment. That's a blessing. Um, and uh, I heard yelling out in the living room. And so I, I walked out in the living room. The guy that lived in my room and then one of the other guys from the other room were out in the living room. And they were just going after each other. Now, this is crazy. These are all preachers. <laughs> um, and they were just screaming back and forth. Guess what it was about? The temperature. The temperature in the apartment. That's what it was about. And they were just, I mean, it was coming. And this guy, I mean, this guy's face was flushed red. And he was getting bowed up. And he would have killed my roommate. I'm just saying. He would have he gone over there, decapitated. It would have been over, you know, really fast. And so I walk out and, you know, when you're seeing conflict happen between two others, what do you do, right? So I did the logical thing. I stepped in between them. And in my mind, I'm going, I'm going to die, you know? And this guy, he stopped, the guy on the other side who wasn't my roommate in my room. He looked at me and he pointed at me and said, don't you even think about saying anything to me. And I said, it's all right, man. He goes, uh-uh. I said, I love you. I don't know, this is obviously the Holy Spirit because I was shaking in my boots, right? And I looked at him and I said, I love you. This isn't worth it. And the whole time I was pushing my roommate behind me back down the hallway to his room. And he, praise the Lord, he went. And I looked at him and I said, I am, I'm not going to do this, man. I love you too much for this. And my voice never elevated. And, no, and again, it was the Holy Spirit doing the work there. And all of a sudden you, you saw the pointing start to kind of get lower. And the redness really never went away, but his tone started to change. And finally, he kind of dropped his arms. He said, whatever. And he just walked away. It was this verse that God had laid on my heart before, as I walked out there and was in that situation. A soft answer 
turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. How will you respond with your speech when there's conflict in the home? We are to respond with grace and with wisdom. The third area that Paul tells us here in the way we're supposed to communicate with one another, talk to one another, is that we are to demonstrate effectiveness or purpose in our speech. Effectiveness or purpose in our speech. So here's the, here's the big question today. How are we to apply gracious, winsome, and wise speech in our families? Well, Paul instructs the Colossians uh, that the goal of godly speech is so that you may, be, may know how you ought to answer each person. In other words, we are to respond to each person intentionally as we communicate through words of love, patience, and wisdom. We're to treat each person as we would want to be treated, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12. You see, the goal is to model Jesus and His gospel in the life of our family as we relate to one another, both in word and in deed. The Apostle Peter speaks to this in 1 Peter 3, 15. He says, listen to this and don't miss this today, but in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Why would we want to honor Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts? Uh, it goes back to something Jesus said, that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And therefore, if we honor Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts, what is our speech going to be like? But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's for outsiders, insiders, family, whoever. Listen, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Why? So that you may win your brother. The Apostle Paul gives us the general principle, and maybe this is your memory verse for the week. I don't know. Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let me ask you a question this morning. How do you talk to one another in your home? Now, I have to admit, I, I, I fail in this all the time, too. And there'll be times I'll just be really selfish. Like yesterday. Man, I didn't talk to the cats well at all. Can I just tell you that? Now, I've, I fail with my wife and children. That's another story. But yesterday... Out, uh, Laura and Emma Kay have been out of town and on a college visit, and, and uh, both cats, we have two cats. Yes, we have two cats. They started rubbing up against me, and it was getting to a point where it was just getting really annoying, right? So you just want to kind of drop, you know, drop kick them through the goalpost after a while. You know, they're just rubbing on you, rubbing on you. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. They kept rubbing on me, rubbing on me. I'm like, what is, I start talking to them. What is wrong with you? And they just stare at me, you know. What is wrong with you? And then something hit my head. Huh. And I walked in the other room and I looked and they had no food and no water. And I went, oh, their purpose wasn't to be annoying. Their purpose was to communicate with me. So there's nothing more humbling than bowing. Now, I didn't bow to the cats and ask their forgiveness. That's not what I'm saying. But getting on my knees and refilling their food and water reminded me to pay attention to the needs around me. How do you talk to one another in your home? Do you realize that there may be times where speech coming out of someone's mouth is just a symptom of a deeper problem? Something that's going on in their hearts. A need that needs to be met in their lives. Daddy, 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 daddy. You had that happen, dads? Daddy, daddy, daddy. What? Daddy, dad, you know, that over and over. Maybe there's a deeper need than for that child to know your name. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's a hug. Maybe it's a dirty diaper. I don't know. Wherever you happen to be in life. But are you gauging the heart by the words? How are you speaking to one another in your home? Is it with humble, loving, gracious, winsome, wise speech? Or is it with impatient, harsh, and unloving words? If it's the latter, then what needs to improve in your personal walk, first of all, and in your family's life to communicate with each other in a godly way? And how can you change how you talk with each other so that Christ is modeled and proclaimed in your family and in your home? If we're to be the people God has called us to be so that we can do what God has called us to do, then it begins with our relationship with our spouses. It begins in the life of the home, and that is tempered by how we talk with one another.